What is the gospel? They say it's good news. But why? It seems as though it is simply a list of do's and don'ts, and we keep beating ourselves up for not being able to obey them all. No, the gospel can't be law. The gospel has to do with death, but the death of sin, so that we can truly live. The gospel isn't a one-time thing. It is a journey, a journey through every area of life, a journey through our ups and downs, a journey through trials and triumphs, a journey to the Father's kingdom, a journey that needs to be rediscovered. Well, amen. Once again, it's great to see you today. Take your Bibles, uh, your phones, your iPad, and turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to look at just one verse today, but one uh, jam-packed, powerful verse that has been speaking to me all week long, and uh, I'm confident it will speak to you as well. So, so before we jump in, so how many of you are fans of, I know this is kind of a goofy question, but how many of you are fans of uh, monarch butterflies? Anybody fans of monarch butterflies? Some of you are. Some of you like, isn't it Jerry Seinfeld who's scared of butterflies? I'm not sure. Anybody scared of butterflies? I'm not, I'm not sure. But um, without a doubt, the, the monarch butterfly is one of God's most beautiful, one of God's most exquisite Creations. If you ever had an opportunity to see one up close, the exquisiteness, the beauty of a monarch bu- bl- butterfly, butterfly. Let me say that real quick. Uh, <laughs> butterfly is astounding. Yet uh, their their beauty is is not their most amazing detail. There are other facts about monarch butterflies that I think are even more astounding than their beauty. For example, you probably know this, but they are long-distance travelers. Uh, Just about every fall, monarch butterflies begin this journey, and some of them travel as far as 3,000 miles And they travel down to the Southern California coast. Many of them travel to a place in Mexico. There's a specific place in Mexico where literally millions of these butterflies come. To me, it's amazing that this little creature can can travel such a long distance. They say that they themselves at times can travel up to 15, 20 miles an hour. But if they go high enough, they get caught in that wind stream and they're able to be taken much faster than that. They're long distance travelers. But, but above and beyond that, they are champions of radical change. I, I was reminded of this this week. I'm, I'm sure I learned it in second grade or third grade or somewhere along the line. Dr. Hill can remind me where we learned this. But um, I was reminded of the fact that butterflies are not born butterflies. Did you know that? All right, you all knew that. I'm sorry. I have like a second or third grade mentality, and I was reminded of that today. There has never been a butterfly that was born a butterfly. All butterflies, now now listen, if you're a science teacher and I'm just a little wrong with that, please come and correct me afterward, but but, but I think I'm right. I'm always scared. Alex is back here somewhere, and Alex is is our science buff. Am I right, Alex? Am I right? Okay, he's being kind. All right, he's being kind. All right, butterflies are not born uh, butterflies. There's a transformation that occurs. There's actually four phases, four different stages of the transformation to a butterfly. The first is the egg stage. Now, we have some pictures. Don't be deceived by by the size of that egg on the screen. A, A butterfly egg is no larger than a pinhead. It is extremely small. And they say that it takes up to 30 days for a butterfly egg to hatch and then the larvae to be born. So the first phase is the egg phase, we might say. The next phase is the caterpillar stage. This is known as the feeding stage. Now, I love this. The job of a caterpillar is to eat. 
I sat back and thought, what a great job. I mean, I mean, if the fact that God placed me on the earth and God said, Brian, here's what I want you to do for all of your existence, I just want you to eat. Can you handle that? I'd be like, I can handle that. I can handle that. A, a caterpillar eats up to, catch this, 27,000 times its weight in food. And caterpillars will grow up to 1,000 times it's, or, or its body mass will increase up to a thousand times. And so here's this caterpillar that is eating and eating, and all day long it eats, and the caterpillar has to eat enough to sustain itself through um, adulthood. And so after finally, whenever in that internal clock that, that, that the caterpillar realizes that it's eaten enough, all of a sudden the third stage is the pupa stage, the transition stage, the chrysalis stage, or the most common term is the cocoon stage. When the caterpillar um, is full grown and stops eating, it, it, it becomes, it transforms itself into this pupa, into this cocoon. The pupa of butterflies, as I mentioned, is also called a chrysalis, or we refer to it as a cocoon. This stage can last anywhere from a few weeks to a month. Some of them even go much longer. They can last up to a couple of years, but it's generally about 30 days. Now, it may look like nothing is going on inside of that pupa, inside of that chrysalis, inside of that cocoon, but big changes are happening inside of that pupa. And then when that butterfly comes out of that cocoon, it's the adult stage. It's the stage that you and I think of when we think of butterflies. Now, I, I use all of that as an example because the word that is used to talk about the transformation that occurs from a, from a caterpillar to a butterfly is the term metamorphosis. Uh, we've all heard that term, metamorphosis. The word metamorphosis literally means a complete change of character, a change of appearance, or a change of condition. I mean, if, if there's a metamorphosis in any creature, there's a metamorphosis from a caterpillar, this, this, this crawly little bug that crawls along the ground to this beautiful caterpillar that soars in the sky. Or, or excuse me, a, a, a butterfly that soars in the sky. A drastic transformation that takes place. But I realized this week that there is a species whose transformation is even more radical than that of a monarch butterfly. There's a creature's transformation that is so revolutionary, so drastic, so complete that it cannot happen alone. It only occurs through the power of God. You know where I'm going with this. The transformation that I'm speaking of today is the change that is accomplished in the life of a sinner when they embrace the gospel and they allow the power of Christ's life, Christ's death, and Christ's resurrection to radically transform them. There's this metamorphosis that takes place. A sinner is transformed into a saint. Death is transformed into life. A person is turned from darkness into light. They are transferred from the power of Satan to the power of God. There is a radical transformation. So here's my question as I begin today. First of all, this. Has that transformation occurred in your life? Has there been a metamorphosis, a divinely empowered metamorphosis that has radically changed your life? That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about in the, verse, in the verses that we're looking at today. So we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to read all of the verses that we studied last week as well because I want to put it in context. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. You can follow along. We'll put it up on the screen. I'm reading from the ESV. Paul says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we don't regard him thus any longer. Our verse that we're studying today. 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Would you read that verse with me? Let's read that verse together. That's the text that we're studying today. Let's read it together. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Verse 18, all this is from God. Notice, change comes from whom? From God. It it doesn't come from us. It's not that I, you know, pick myself up from my bootstraps and I determine to change. No, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, Christ, or in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal to us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Five times the word reconciled is used in the passage. Verse 21, for our sake, God made Jesus. He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Would you pray with me today as we study this passage of Scripture. Would you just, in your heart, say a little prayer? God, help me to have ears to hear today, a sensitive heart to listen to the Holy Spirit of God. If there's anything old in my life, God, point it out. If there's anything that needs to be made new, point it out in my life. Help me to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Would you pray that today? Father, thank you for the ministry of reconciliation. Thank you that you have taken sinners, worthless sinners, and you have reconciled us to yourself. Lord, you've taken those of us who in no way, in no form could ever please you. And because of Jesus, You've made us pleasing to yourself. We thank you so much for that. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to equally realize the desire that you have to change us, the power that you give us to change. And so today, I pray that as you shine a light on different areas of our hearts, different areas of our life, help us to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God. Help us to be willing to put off the old. Help us by God's grace and God's empowerment to put on the new. Help us to soar with wings like butterflies, like eagles. Change us into who you desire for us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week we saw in the latter verses of this chapter what theologians have called the great exchange, the the paradox of redemption. The idea that all of our sins were transferred to Jesus Christ. Verse 21, he who knew no sin became sin for us. He became our Sin. And so he became that sin offering, that, that sacrifice that propitiated, that appeased the wrath of God for sin. Jesus became that sin for us, and our sins were transferred over to him. And then that divine exchange, the perfect righteousness, the perfection, the holiness of Jesus Christ was transferred into our accounts And we saw last week that we are united with Christ. So much so that when God the Father sees us, he doesn't see us as sinners. Even though we continue to blow it and and, uh, commit sins, he doesn't see us for who we actually are at this moment. He sees us through the lens, through the filter of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He became sin for us and we become his righteousness. 
Someone might sit back, though, and say, okay, Brian, I, I get that. Man, what, what an awesome truth. So right now, God sees me as he sees Jesus. Is that right, Brian? Yeah, you're right on track. So does that mean that I can live any way that I want? <laughs> does that mean that now that my, my sins have already been paid for, that, that, that God doesn't actually see the sin that I commit. Does that mean that I can live any way that I want? My sins are paid for. I've been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What an opportunity for me to live how I would like to live and just let God and Jesus sort it out later. (laughs) Seems like that would make sense from a human point of view. Does it not? Well, of course not. In the passage of scripture that Jason read just a few moments ago, the Romans asked that exact same question. Because they said, okay, let's get this straight. If every time I sin, the grace of God is manifested in my life, doesn't it make sense for me to sin more so that more of God's grace will be manifested in my life? Every time I sin, God demonstrates his grace. So I want to sin more so that I have more grace. Makes sense, right? And, and here's what the Greek says. No way, Jose, all right? In Spanish, de ninguna manera, no way. How can those who have already been redeemed from sin, freed from sin, continue to live under the bondage of sin? Well, in in verse 17, I told you we were going to talk about that. In verse 17, the Apostle Paul clarifies the clear-cut reason of us being reconciled to God. And he clarifies the reason why not only should change occur in our life, but he clarifies the reason why change will occur in the life of a believer. And so he sees that. I want you to see two simple things in your outline. If you're following along in your outline, the very first thing that I wrote is this. To be in Christ means that you are in a relationship. Notice verse 17 once again, and we're going we're gonna to dissect this and kind of flesh it out. But in verse 17, Paul says, therefore, if anyone is, and notice what he says. He doesn't say, therefore, if anyone is in Hollywood Community Church. Or therefore, if anyone is, is uh, um, uh, in church. He says, no, therefore, if anyone is what? In Christ. The phrase in Christ is one of Paul's favorite expressions. Uh, In Christ, along with in Christ Jesus, or or in the Lord, or in Him, any derivative of, of that phrase is found 164 times in Paul's epistles. As a matter of fact, you'll notice that Paul rarely uses the term Christian. If we identified ourselves, if somebody asked you, what are you? Which I'm sure at times we're asked, we would say, why I'm a Christian. Or or we might say, I'm a believer, or I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, which is probably a little bit more of a New Testament term. But, But Paul rarely uses any of those terms. The phrase that Paul uses to describe Christians, believers, followers of Jesus Christ is the simple phrase, in Christ. He uses it 164 times. For example, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 21, Paul says, greet every saint in Christ. What is he saying? Greet every believer who is what? Who is in Christ Jesus. Colossians 1.27, to the saints and faithful brothers, how does he say? In Christ Jesus at Colossae. So this morning, if you're a Christian, If you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are in Christ. And quite frankly, if you are not in Christ, you're not a believer. If you're not in Christ, you are not a follower of his. Notice the second thing, catch this, because the phrase in Christ is a simplified expression that speaks of every aspect of our union with Christ. I love the simplicity of Paul. And I love how Paul takes this deep, 
profound subject, which is our salvation, our union with Christ, and he synthesizes it, he simplifies it to what? To its simplest common denominator. And so when Paul is talking about in Christ, the only two words yet two words that are powerfully packed together. It fully describes our identity. It fully describes who we are in Jesus. It fully describes our relationship with God. Let's flesh that out a little bit more. I I put three uh, arrow notes in your outlines underneath that. First of all, an in Christ relationship is a foundational relationship. It's foundational. Although generic in sound, and it does, it sounds as simple, as generic as we can't get more simple than the word in, all right? In Christ, it sounds generic, but it encompasses every aspect of your salvation. Let me, let me show you a couple of verses, all right? Let me show you. First of all, notice in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. We're going to put these up on the screen. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. Paul says this, even as he, God, chose us, notice the phrase, what? In him. In whom? Who's he talking about? In Jesus. Even as God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So, so this phrase, in Christ, is talking about what? It's talking about your election. It's talking about the fact that you were chosen by God. I was chosen by God. And look at that. I love that. When did God choose you? This is such a cool concept, and we don't have time to flesh it out. But God chose you before the world was created. Before the world was brought into being, God chose you. He selected you. You are chosen by God. Let me show you another verse. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Romans 8, 1, Paul says this, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are, what does he say? In Christ Jesus. So, so this in Christ relationship not only talks about your election, but it also talks about your justification. He says because you are in Christ, there's what? The, the, there's no condemnation. You don't ever have to worry about standing before the judge. You don't have to worry about standing before God and God declaring you guilty. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because you have been declared righteous in the sight of God just as if you never, ever sinned. In Christ talks about your justification. You've been justified by God. Let me show you another verse. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26. Paul says this, For once again... In Christ, you are all sons of God through faith. And so, what does in Christ refer to? Our adoption. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. When when did I become a part of the family of God? When I entered into that relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you entered into that relationship with him, you were adopted, you became one of his special children. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified, what does he say? In Christ Jesus. So here's what I want you to catch. That in Christ relationship, that phrase that Paul uses to describe our relationship with the Lord is used over and over and over again in the Bible. It is foundational. It talks about the fact we've been chosen by God. We've been justified by God. We've been adopted by God. We've been sanctified. It encompasses every aspect of your relationship with Jesus and my relationship with Jesus. It is foundational. There's the second thing that we see, though. It's not only a foundational relationship, but that in Christ relationship is a reciprocal relationship. Reciprocal means to be given or felt by one another. It speaks of something that is mutual, kind of a two-way 
relationship, right? I mean, my wife and I's relationship is, is two-way, right? She cooks for me, and I tell her thank you, all right? Two-way relationship, all right? She, she does all the fixing up around the house, and I look at her and say, good job, Vicki, you've done great. Two-way relationship. It's a mutual relationship. Well, well, your relationship with Jesus is a mutual relationship. We've already seen that Paul says over and over again that you are in Christ, But did you know that you are not only in Christ, but did you know that Christ is also in you? It's a two-way relationship. In Christ, 164 times. Let me show you this verse, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. Notice what Paul says. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is what? Christ in you, the hope of glory. So not only are you in Christ, But at this moment, Jesus Christ is in you. The fact that he indwells us, that our bodies are his temple, it's what? It is a reciprocal relationship. The third thing that I wrote down about this in Christ relationship is that it's a beneficial relationship. What does that mean? It means it benefits us. I um, I love kids. I do. Um, We have some 380 some students here at School Mike, some 380 students. And and I love, sometimes I don't get to get out there as much as I I, I like to, but I love kind of walking the hallways. I love giving the students the fist pump and, you know, giving them a high five. I, I, I feel for the teachers sometimes because they have them in such an orderly line until Brian shows up and everybody, hey, Pastor Brian, and they're all giving me a high five and the teachers are trying to keep the kids in order and I'm kind of getting them riled up just a little bit. I love kids. I love to go to the hospital and hold brand new babies. In fact, uh, everybody teases me because I try to be the first one to the hospital. I want that Facebook picture, you know, with Pastor Brian and the baby, all right? If you have a baby, I'm going to do that. I love kids. I love grabbing the little kids in our congregation and kind of loving on them and and, uh, letting them know that they're special. But now, now there is one baby. There is one child in our church that in my mind is loved so much more than all the other kids. You say, Brian, who is that? You knew I was going to do it. Here's a picture of my granddaughter that was born eight days ago. All right, why why is she more special to me than all the other kids? Why? Duh. She's she's my granddaughter. She's She's flesh and blood, all right? Um, there's this unique bond. There's this unique relationship. I want to make sure that all of her needs are taken care of. And I know that Mark and April are going to do a wonderful job in raising her up and providing for her needs and bringing her up and the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. But where is Mark? If you don't, Mark, you're in trouble. (laughs) All right? Why? She's my granddaughter. She's my daughter. As a result... I want her to have everything that she needs. By the way, it's mom and dad's job to give her everything she needs. It's grandpa's job to give her everything she wants, right? (laughs) I want her to benefit from that relationship. Listen, because you are in Christ, there's so many benefits that you receive. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? Do you have physical needs today? Maybe there's a physical need in your life, something that, that you desperately need. I'm not talking about wants, but I'm talking about needs. Maybe it's something that, that you need and you just have no idea where it's gonna come from. Listen, if you're a child of God, that's not a problem. Paul said in Philippians chapter four and verse 19, my God will supply all of your needs in his riches or in his glory by Christ Jesus. You tired? You burdened? You feel like there's there's a weight on you that you just cannot continue to carry? That's not a problem. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you need peace? 
Maybe you're going through just a tumultuous situation at work or at home and you just sit back sometimes and say, oh my word, I just want peace. That's not a problem. John chapter 14 and verse 27, Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives to you. God wants to give you peace. Listen, here's what I want you to see. In Christ, the fact that you are in Christ means that you're in a special relationship with him. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, Peter says this, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. This in Christ relationship that you have with God, because there was a moment when you realized that you were a sinner. You could not do it on your own. And by faith, you reached out to Jesus Christ. This in Christ relationship that you have is so important to God that he's promised to give you and I everything that you need. Everything that I need. And so the first question we have to ask ourselves today is this. Are you in Christ You'd say, hey, Brian, it's Sunday morning. I'm in church. That's not what I'm asking today. God bless you for being in church today. Are you in Christ? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? I'm not asking whether you're religious. I'm not asking whether you're Baptist. I'm not asking whether you're conservative or whether you're liberal. I'm asking whether you are in Christ. Do you have an ongoing relationship with him? See, that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. To be in Christ means that you have a relationship with him. But, but I want you to see a second thing in the passage. That's just the per- first part. If anyone is in Christ, but the second thing is this. To be in Christ means you are radically changed. To be in Christ means that there is a change that is taking place in your life. There is a metamorphosis that is taking place in your, in your life. Notice the change words that are in this verse, all right? Notice the change words that Paul uses. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new what? A new creation, all right? Some older translations say a new creature, but the idea is what? That God is creating something new. And then he says what? The old has Another transition verb, what? Passed away. And so those old habits, old thoughts, all of that is passed away. And all things are now becoming what? New. So, 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 so within the text, Paul gives us these, these transition, these change words that demonstrate what being in Christ does for us. Catch today, this isn't just a minor modification. This is a major overhaul that God accomplishes in our life. Uh, please, please catch, we don't just slowly but surely evolve into being a Christian. I understand that spiritual growth is a process and some people grow extremely fast and other people grow at different phases. And I think it's very dangerous to sit back and judge ourselves by others. We shouldn't do that. But Paul is very clear on the fact that if you are in Christ, there is a change that is occurring in your life. Your behavior is becoming different. The way you think is becoming different. The way you act is becoming different. The way you talk is becoming different. Why? Because you're no longer living on your own. You are now what? You are united with Jesus Christ. And the power of an almighty God is in your life. It's always so puzzling to me to see people who profess to be believers and there's no change, zero change in their life. It's like, listen, are you not connected to the same faucet that I'm connected to? Are you not connected to the same God who produces change in me? Because it's not something that we produce. It is something that God produces in us. I want you to see another passage of Scripture. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. 
Beginning in verse 17, Paul, Paul uses almost the same terminology. Ephesians chapter 4, we'll begin in verse 17. Notice what Paul says. Now this I say in testifying the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Let me pause that because I don't want you to think that he's making a Jew-Gentile decision or, or distinction. You might sit back and say, well, first of all, how do Jews walk, okay? If Jews walk this way, how do Gentiles walk? He's using the term Gentiles, speaking of unbelievers. Some of your Bibles might even say pagans, all right? Now this I say and testify to you in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, as the pagans do, as those who don't know Jesus Christ do. How do they walk? They walk in the futility of their minds, verse 18. They are darkened in their understanding. They're alienated from the life of God. And because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart, verse 19, they have become callous, and as a result, they've given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But Paul looks at the Ephesians and he says, but that's not the way you learned Jesus Christ. That was you before you developed this in Christ relationship. That was you before you became a believer. Verse 21, Paul says, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus. Verse 22, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So if you're following along in your notes, very simply, I, I wrote this, to be radically changed means to what? It means to lay aside. It means to take off that former way of living, to put it aside. Just as I, just as I take off a jacket and kind of toss a jacket aside, that, that old way that I lived, that old way that I thought, that old way that I reacted, that old way that I responded to my wife whenever she aggravated me, that old way that I would blow up when I'm driving down the road. Okay, I still do that sometimes. I still do that occasionally. I know that's what Vicky's thinking, all right? But, but what happened? I what? I, I take that off. Just as I take off an old, dirty, sweaty pair of clothes, I take it off and I lay it aside. And by God's grace, I say, okay, God, listen, I want to change. I know I can't change myself. And so by your grace, by your power, each and every day, I want to take off those old actions, those old thoughts, and I want to put them in my closet, and I never want to put them on again. I take them off. I lay them aside. We lay aside our former way of thinking, our former way of acting, our former way of responding. To be radically changed means to lay aside. So, so here's where I want to get a little personal this morning. What is it of your former life that you haven't taken off? What, what is it of your life before you came a believer that is still a part of your wardrobe, that doesn't need to be a part of your wardrobe. Maybe it's your vocabulary that, man, those words flew before and they fly now. Maybe, maybe it's that temper that, that you have just not been able to get under control and you just blow it sometimes. Maybe it's the thought life, guys, Maybe it's the thought life and you still struggle with that. And, and, and yet, day after day, you allow yourself to put on that, that former way of thinking and acting. Paul says, with God's enablement, with God's empowerment, take it off and lay it aside. There's a second thing that he says, and the second thing actually modifies the third thing, but let me mention it, because the second thing that he says is this, to be radically changed means to be renewed. It's interesting, this is the only time this specific word is, is used in the New Testament, and yet the idea is, is found in other corollary passages, the idea of being renewed. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Paul says this, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. Notice the idea, be transformed by the renewal, by the renewing of your mind. 
And so in order for a change to occur in my life, in order for a change to occur in your life, I have to recognize the things in my life that I have to take off. And each and every day I allow God to search my heart and to say, okay, God, here's the things I need to take off. With your help and with your empowerment, I'm going to take them off. And God, I want to renew my mind. I want to begin to change the way I think. I want my thought processes to be different. I want the way that I view the world, my worldview, to be complete completely different. And God, I can't do that on my own. I need you to do it through me. And so I want to be different from the world. And so I want my my mind to be renewed. And if if I can be blunt, pastorally blunt this morning, one of the reasons why we as Christians are not transforming our culture is because we are not renewing our minds. We're allowing our minds to be influenced by the culture in which we live. And if we're not renewed in our mind, we're not going to be renewed externally. And if we're not careful, we think like unbelievers. We allow sinful thoughts and sinful actions, and yeah, I'm going to say it, sinful television shows and sinful movies to fill in our mind. And the simple truth is what's in the well is coming up in the bucket. And what you're putting in your mind is going to come out in your actions. Paul says this, you want to be changed? You want to see a drastic change take place in your life? Be renewed. The only way you're ever going to be renewed is to spend time in God's Word and to allow the Word of God, taken by the Holy Spirit of God, to change you. If the only time you're ever in God's Word is on Sunday mornings, I'm so glad you're here on Sunday mornings, and I want you to be here on Sunday morning, every Sunday morning, but if the only time you are exposed to God's Word is on Sunday morning, you are not going to change. It's not enough to renew your mind. You and I have to expose ourselves to God's Word on a regular basis and allow the Word of God to change us and mold us and shape, reshape our thinking. So now we begin to think not as the world thinks, but now we begin to think as God thinks. Many of you have already gone through that. I mean, you, you become a believer and you're sitting in front of the television and all of a sudden you're watching something that you used to watch before. And now all of a sudden, boy, there's a little bit of conviction that's taking place. You realize there's just a little voice in the back of your head. Man, you shouldn't be watching this. It's the Holy Spirit of God. Somebody somebody said this, I like this. After you're a believer, you can still sin. You just don't enjoy it as much. Why is that? Because you have the Holy Spirit of God. You are united with Jesus Christ. I mean, I mean, if if, if Jesus said, hey, let's go to the movie theater. You want to go watch a movie with me? I guarantee you're going to be pretty selective what movie you're going to watch, right? Why? Because Jesus is with you. If Jesus said, hey, let's go out for the evening, you're going to be pretty selective where you're going to take him. Why? Because Jesus is with you. As you plan your night's activities, you're going to be selective as to what you select to do. Why? Because Jesus is with you. Church, catch it. As a believer, you are in Christ. You are united in Christ. Everywhere you go, everything you do, everything you think, He is with you each and every step of the way. Recognize His presence in your life. Be renewed. The third thing that Paul says To be radically changed means to put on. You say, Brian, what does that mean? It means exactly what it says, to put on. Just as you take off that old way of thinking and that old way of acting, so you take this new way of acting, this new way of thinking, and you put it on. Notice what Paul says in verse 24. I think we have it up on the screen. Verse 24, and to put on the new self. What new self? Created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. You know, quite frankly, here's what Paul's saying to put it in really practical terms. Some of us need a spiritual wardrobe change. We we go into our spiritual closet and we decide, what am I going to wear today? And because we haven't spent time with God and because we don't understand God, we don't get his holiness and his righteousness, we don't even know what God wants us to put on. 
And so here's what Paul is saying. Paul says, listen, add to your spiritual wardrobe. You say, Brian, how do I do that? You take God's word, Galatians chapter 3, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, and you add that to your wardrobe. And each and every day you get up and you say, okay, God, today I am intentionally taking off all of the works of darkness, and I am intentionally putting on the fruit of the Spirit. I want to demonstrate that in my life today. God, I want you to change me. You see, 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 here's what Paul is saying, to use that analogy that we made in the very beginning of the butterfly. Uh, Paul says that within the individual cocoon, pupa chrysalis of your life, when you're in Christ, the power of sin begins to dissolve away, and God changes us into something new. God changes us into something beautiful. God changes us into something complete. Can I tell you as a pastor what gives me the most satisfaction, hands down? You say, Brian, what is that? Have a good attendance? I like that but that's not what gives me the most satisfaction. Have a big offering. I like that, I'm not gonna lie. That's not what gives me the most satisfaction. What gives me the most satisfaction is to see God at work in your life. And to sit back as an observer and see God change you. Not you change you, but to see God change you. And as you surrender to the Holy Spirit of God each and every day to see God little by little begin to chip away at those attitudes, at those sinful ways of thinking and begin to change you. Now, I get in the passage, Paul uses what we call the aorist tense. He talks about something that happens simultaneously, but you know as well as I do, change is not something that happens one time and it never continues to happen. What do you say? What am I saying? I'm saying God's continuing to change me. Even as I sat before God this week and I read this verse, I've known this verse since I was eight years old. I sat before God and I said, okay, God, change me. What are some things in my life that I need to take off? And what are some things in my life that I need to put on? And God, as only God can, indicated some things in my life that still need to change. Are you changing? Are you in Christ? Are you changing? Here's the realization. It's in your outline. The realization is this. The gospel produces such a radical change in your life that it transforms you into one of God's most beautiful creations. God does it. God does it. We sit back. It's passive for us. Yeah, I know we got to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. I get that. We have to take off. We have to put on. But at the end of the day, it's not me who does the work of transformation. Because if it was me, I could take credit for it. But I can't take credit for it. And neither can you. Because it's God who does the work in us. As we understand the truth of the gospel, as we understand All of my sins have been placed in Jesus Christ's account. And I have graciously been given something that I could never ever deserve. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. That motivates me to come before God and say, okay God, and here I am. I'm just an empty vessel. Use me, fill me, correct me, change me, wash me. Do whatever you have to do to make me into the vessel of transformation that you want me to be. Here's the question today. Are you living like a caterpillar or are you living like a butterfly? Why why would you want to continue to crawl along the earth when you can soar in the heavens? Why would you want to continue to eat dirt and things from the ground when you can eat the sweet nectar of the word of God. 
allow the Holy Spirit of God and the gospel to change you. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passing away, and all things are becoming new. God wants to change you. Would you allow him to do that?